I can start now? Yeah. All right then. Okay, so we have, um, this is part three of our lectures on frustration of circumstances. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Uh, where is our PowerPoint? Yeah, we're up here. Yeah. So we uh, have talked about the first section, which is what circumstances are potentially frustrating of the contract. Secondly, we've talked about construction of the contract, what risks of were allocated in the contract. In particular, were the uh, super, supervening events which occurred, were the risks of that allocated to one or other party, in which case you have to go on with your contract, you just get sued for breach, as opposed to being able to get out of the contract for frustration. The third main topic uh, is fault. Was, uh, one, was the party who's trying to claim frustration, were they at fault? Okay, there's no frustration if the claimant, if their own deliberate or negligent conduct has brought about the alleged frustrating event. In that case, the supervening event is not something altogether outside the control of the parties and the claimant remains liable uh, for breach of contract. It's up to the party suing for breach to prove that the event was self-induced, that is, there was some sort of breach of contract so that there is no frustration. So let's look at the types of uh, the ways in which you can prove that the frustrating event was self-induced. First, a party can't plead frustration if she has contributed to the alleged frustrating event by conduct that would amount to breach of contract. So for example, there's no frustration if um, a charterer orders a ship into a war zone, which is in breach of contract, where it then becomes detained by um, by the enemy, or if a carrier's ship was um, unseaworthy, right, and that causes a delay uh, which then made the journey impossible to complete because of some supervening outbreak of war. The second way in which um, the supervening event can be self-induced is um, if her deliberate, voluntary, or negligent conduct has the effect of disabling her from performing the contract. If it's because of her, what she has done, that she is unable to perform the contract. Now, the issue here is control. And the test is whether the claimant had the means and the opportunity to prevent the alleged frustrating event from occurring, but nevertheless caused or permitted it to occur. Lord Russell said, the possible varieties are infinite and can range from the criminality, well, can range from the criminality of the scuttler who opens the seacocks and sinks his ships to the thoughtlessness of the prima donna who sits in a draft and loses her voice. However, not every destruction of the corpus for which a contractor can be said to some extent or in some sense to be responsible necessarily excludes frustration for being self-induced. It is a matter of degree. So the court said in Joseph Constantine, an imperial smelting corporation. Now, if one party is disqualified by her self-induced frustration, the other party can still uh, rely on uh, what would otherwise be a frustrating event. So in Shepherd and Jerome, uh, Jerome, was detained in a borstal for 39 weeks, and this prevented him from performing his apprenticeship contract. But, um, you know, and he can't plead um, frustration because, you know, it was his own conduct, so it was his fault, so he can't claim frustration. But his employer can rely upon uh, his incarceration as a frustrating event, um, and that would justify his, um, defense to Jerome's claim for, for unfair dismissal, okay? And it's up to the party alleging self-induced frustration um, to prove it. All right, 
Now, the most controversial section in fault is this idea of power to elect. So where a party enters into a number of different contracts and an external event partially destroys her supplies so that she can't satisfy all her contracts, she'll have to choose which contracts to satisfy and which ones to um, leave unperformed. Okay, so in those circumstances, can she frustrate the contracts that she can't perform? Right, and, and um, so you can think about the example, let's say that someone um, has a lot of masks and which we're all after these days or um, hand wash or whatever. And um, they, you know, sell a hundred to 10 people but then realize that they haven't got a thousand masks, they've only got 800. So they then can choose which of the 10 people they're going to allocate the masks to, and they'll have to not perform two of them. Can they frustrate those two contracts on the basis that um, maybe, it, you know, for some frustrating event means that they can't get the masks in? Well, the law says the very fact that a party has exercised their choice not to perform a certain contract uh, bars frustration of the contract. Her choice, her exercise of choice, breaks the chain of causation between the external event and her inability to perform. So in contrast, frustration would be permitted if the outside event completely destroys a party's supplies. So say that or or thousand masks were um, I don't know destroyed by a meteorite strike, right? Then obviously she can frustrate all of them. But if if the meteorite strike only destroys some of them, um, then she by because she has a choice which ones to satisfy, she can't frustrate the contract. The reason you can't perform this contract is because you chose not to. Um, or you and. On, on the other hand, you can frustrate the contract if you've specified only one way of performing or one way of allocating the supply, and that becomes impossible um, because of the outside event. So two examples. In a case called Maritime National Fish and Ocean Trawler, uh, Maritime chartered from Ocean Trawler a trawler for otter trawling. Now, both sides know that such trawlers can only be operated with a license. And so Maritime applied for five licenses, but only received three licenses, which they allocated to other trawlers, including their own trawlers. And then they said, oh, sorry, we hired your ship, but we couldn't get a, um, a license, so we have to frustrate your contract, we're not gonna pay. The Privy Council held that Maritime was liable to pay, um, uh, for the hire because the trawler was only not able, not usable for, for trawling because of um, Maritime's own election, their own choices of which uh, trawlers to allocate the licenses to. The contract would have been possible to perform if Maritime had allocated a license to um, Ocean Trawler's trawler. So it was impossible for maritime, it, sorry, it was possible for maritime to perform all of its contracts. Um, it could have done it by not allocating a license to their own boats. This is followed by a more controversial decision called the Super Servant 2. That's the name of the ship. In this case, W agreed to transport um, Al's drilling rig. Uh, between certain dates using um, at its option either one of two ships, the Super Servant 1 or the Super Servant 2. Now, W internally allocated the Super Servant 2 to um, the contract, right? They said it wasn't in the contract, but they decided, you know, that, that which ones they would use. Now, prior to the performance, the Super Servant 2 sank. Um, W then claimed frustration of the contract and the Court of Appeal rejected the claim of frustration because they said it's your own choice not to use the remaining ship, the Super Servant 1, 
that led to the non-performance of the contract. And it wasn't the sinking of the super servant too. Now, the decision in the end was that the carrier, uh, W, was excused under a force majeure clause, uh, in, which covered certain events, including perils or dangers and accidents of the sea. So you can see that a party can guard against the finding of self-induced frustration by eliminating the choice. For example, by in the contract, if they had said, we will perform your contract by the super servant two, and the super servant two gets sunk, then they would have been able to um, uh, frustrate the contract. But because they said either one or the other, and then they still had one, but they didn't use it, the court said that the contract wasn't frustrated. Another way you can get out of the contract is if you include a suitably worded, worded force majeure clause, as happened in this case. Now, the super servant too has been criticized for leaving the seller or the supplier of goods in an impossible situation where her source partially fails um, due to an unforeseen event. She can't perform all her contracts, but because she is still able to perform some, she won't be able to frustrate any of them. Um, merely choosing which contract not to perform breaks the chain of causation uh, with the supervening event. And the criticism is that the rationale of the frustration doctrine should permit a party who is not at fault, uh, should allow them to frustrate some of the contract um, where the supervening event makes it impossible for her to perform all of her contracts. And um, you know, the, the, just because the claimant, uh, sorry, just because the, um, because there was an element of choice doesn't eclipse the greater causative potency of the external event, the sinking of the ship. So I think the problem is not actually power to elect, but the problem is really um, the worry about favoritism. The real objection is that uh, there's a potential for um, the party with the partial supply to give preferential treatment to her most profitable contract partners um, with a present or prospective. You know, it's not fair. You know, you should treat your contract parties equally. So as I said, the solution could be to require her to allocate. So if she had allocated, you get this one, you get this one, then the choice is gone. Now, in other possible solution is to say that in relation to fungible goods, you know, like potatoes or widgets or wheat or flour, you could say if there's a partial failure, then maybe all of your contract parties should get a rateable amount of it, right? So in the example I gave earlier, if there's um, may maybe instead of you all getting 100 masks, you should all get 80 masks each. But then um, there are problems um, like the super servant who itself, it, which relates to ships. Um, you can't really, you know, rateably divide a ship and say you get a half a ship each. But the principle is the same. The, the supplier should be required to perform her contract in the, perhaps in the order in which the contracts were made, maybe on a first come first serve basis. Um, and one could say that the denial of frustration in the super servant too is consistent with this. The contract which W chose to perform instead of L's, so they allocated the super servant one to another party. And that contract was actually made after L's contract. So in a way, it wasn't fair. L should have got that contract first, right? And also, in this case, they were price gouging because... W only allocated the super servant one to the third party after getting an extra fee from them. So you don't want that, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm currently in the, um, trying to get my, uh, I've made a contract, I've even paid for masks, but my supplier has only de de um, uh, delivered two fifths of the masks that they owe me. And I'm trying to work out whether they're price gouging. They keep offering to give me my money back because obviously masks are worth a lot more now and they want to do that. And I keep saying, no, thank you. I'll have the masks. We'll see what happens. 
Okay, the next topic and the last topic is what is the effect of frustration? All right, well, I've already told you that, um, let's have a look, what have we got here? Okay, the effect of frustration is, well, first of all, it's automatic discharge. The contract just kind of collapses. The consent runs out, the contract no longer binds the parties. And the parties and the parties themselves can't choose, can't agree that they're going to keep the contract on foot. But the question is, what happens uh, to the losses and the gains made, uh, the losses incurred, the gains made in, in performance of the contract up to the point of frustration? So let's say that um, I've given you um, an example on the PowerPoint. Let's say that A, let's say that I agreed to pay you 50,000 pounds for 10 performances. You're a rock star for 10 performances in my theater. Now at the point of frustration, let's say that, um, that let's say that um, maybe COVID-19 means that large gatherings are not allowed or that um, the theater is declared unsafe or destroyed by fire. Now at that point, I might have actually paid you some money or I might have owe you some money. I might have also incurred other costs in furtherance of my own contractual performance. For example, maintaining the theater or advertising the performances you're going to give, all right? Selling tickets. Um, and on the other hand, you might have given all or just some of the performances. You might have incurred costs in furtherance of your contractual performances. For example, you've hired background dancers or you've made costumes, you've made elaborate and wild costumes. What happens when uh, the contract is frustrated and the law shouts basically stop, okay? Uh, what happens to those gains and losses? Well, the New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand, you have the Frustrated Contracts Act, which is now incorporated into the Contract and Commercial Act 2017. And this um, all came from the English Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act. So the same, the position is the same. Um, so the, the position is now um, um, governed by the Act, but we need to know what the law, common law was like before the Act in order to understand why the Act is the way it is. So the common law position is that if money is paid or it's due, then it's, then um, basically losses lie where they fall, right? Any sums paid um, cannot be recovered. Any sums due still have to be paid, right? So uh, the main culprit of the case is Chandler and Webster, where the claimant, um, this is another coronation case, the claimant paid a hundred pounds immediately to hire a room to watch the coronation and it was 40, 41 pounds were payable later, right? But before the coronation was canceled. So they paid a hundred pounds, they still had to pay 41 pounds. Coronation gets canceled. Well, they couldn't get their hundred pounds back and they still had to pay their 41 pounds and there was no coronation to, to watch. They could go and sit in an empty room. Now, what about non-money benefits? Well, before, you know, the common law said that the value of goods or services covered under the contract is only recoverable if the sum was due under the contract before the frustrating event. Obligations to pay after um, is discharged by the frustration. So let me give you an example. An Appleby and Myers, a contract to install machinery in, um, in Myers factory and maintain it for two years, payment on completion. Now, an accidental fire destroys the factory and the machinery and the contractor is frustrated. So, um, so Appleby recovers nothing for the work that's already done because payment was only due after the completion. So the, this, you can see that, that these positions are unjust. Um, and so along comes the um, Frustrated Contracts Act, 
copying the English legislation and now incorporated into the Contract and Commercial Act. All right, what's the aim of that? Well, in BP and Hunt, Mr. Justice Goff said that the fundamental principle underlying the Act is the prevention of unjust enrichment of either party to the contract at the other's expense. But it is not the apportionment of loss caused by frustration of the contract. All right. And in the Court of Appeal in BP and Hunt, Lord Justice Lawton said that the purpose of the Act was simply to make the operation of the law more fair. All right. What, um, how do we work this? Well, let's look at the legislation. All right, the Contract and Commercial Law Act 2017, Section 61, re relates to money paid or payable. And it says money paid may be recovered and money payable ceases to be payable. All right, so this is all just uh, what subsection one and subsection two says. So all money paid to a party under the contract before the time of discharge is recoverable from A as money received for A by A for the use of the party who paid it. All money payable to, um, to a party under the contract ceases to be payable. So money should go back. You don't have to pay what you owe, all right? But, all right, continues on. A court may allow a party who has incurred expenses to retain or recover the money. So the payor, the payee, sorry, the payor can recover the money or not pay the sums payable. The payee, right, um, who is supposed to give the money back can deduct or retain um, some amount, some amount, well, how much we'll go and see, which, um, uh, which the, as sums that have been incurred um, as expenses be before the time of discharge or for the purposes of performing the contract. All right, subsection two says the court may, if it considers it just to do so, having regard to all the circumstances, allow that party to recover, um, to retain or recover the whole or any part of the sum of the money that was payable. So they can only um, retain or recover um, up to the ceiling of the sum which was paid or payable. Okay, so let's summarize that. The payor can recover any payments made prior to the frustrating event. The payer no longer has to pay any sums due prior to the discharge for frustration. The court can, if it considers it just, allow the payee to deduct against the sum to be returned, all right, or claim against the sum to be payable, um, but not yet paid, the whole or part of her expenses incurred before the time of discharge in or for the purposes of the performance of the contract. So how do we calculate the just expenses? We have one example. And that is the case of Gamerco and ICM Fair Warning Agency Limited. This involved a concert. So in this concert, uh, $775,000, if you look along the first row, uh, $775,000 was payable by the promoters um, of a concert to a pop group called Guns N' Roses and um, for performance. They had already paid $412,500. Um, $412, They've paid that before the concert venue was declared unsafe and the contract was frustrated. Both sides, in fact, had incurred expenses, right? You can see that the promoter had incurred $450,000 worth of expenses and the pop group had incurred $50,000 worth of expenses. How much? should the promoter um, be able to get back, right? Because obviously what they're doing is they're trying to claim the 412.5 thousand that they have paid. The pop group is saying, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, we've, we've, we've spent 50K. So there is three options. The court, the judge said, well, we could go for total retention by Guns N' Roses. And that would be the first option. That would be 412.5 minus the 50,000, in which case 
the promoters would get back £362,500. Uh, they said we could also, uh, in the alternative, go for an equal apportionment, in which case this um, would be half of the costs of the pop group. And so you can see a deduction of 25K and the promoters would get back $387,500. But in the end, they went for a broad discretion. They said, we have a broad discretion to do justice in a situation in which, um, which the parties had neither contemplated nor provided for and to mitigate the possible harshness of allowing um, all loss to lie where it has fallen. The, uh, Mr. Justice Garland thought there was no indication in the Act, the authorities or the relevant literature that the court is obliged to incline either towards total retention or equal division. And they said neither of these approaches takes into account the payors expenses. Note that the legislation only takes into account the payee's expenses and doesn't seem to take into account at all the payor's expenses, in the, which in this case, 450,000 the promoters had paid, and that seems um, not to come into it. And um, the court therefore said, we're going to exercise our discretion. We think it's just that the pop groups gives back the entirety of the 412,000 and that the pop group um, doesn't get any concession for the 50,000 they, they spent, because after all, the promoter spent a far greater sum of 450,000. All right, so the current approach of allowing just expenses to be deducted from the sum to be returned is really a rough and ready one-step response to the aftermath of frustration. It isn't really, um, it's, it's a pretty rough calculation. It's not really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not really doing loss apportionment. So what's the ceiling of just expenses? Well, the ceiling I've mentioned already is the sums paid, but also the sum which is due, all right? Um, if, you, if, you, if your expenses go above that, then you can't um, claim it. So let's change the facts of Gamoco a little bit. If the, let's say the pop groups wasted expenses was not 50,000, as was actually the case. But let's say the wasted expenses was a, a million dollars. Now, if that's the case, then they would have been able to offset only up to the 775,000, um, and that because, because the amount was due, okay? Because that was the amount that was uh, due to them. Now, it's obviously an advantage uh, to a party to get a large prepayment up front from the other party, and then they can offset their own expenses in the event of frustration. The party who has um, been who's not been paid, but who's incurred expenses, can then claim nothing. All right. If I've incurred a lot of expenses in performing a contract for you, but you haven't prepaid me, it's just tough luck. Right. Um, now, unless this is the big unless, unless my expenses actually conferred a benefit on you, and that's the last section of our lectures. So we then go to non-money benefits. Um, under section 63, uh, sums may be recovered if a party has obtained valuable benefits, all right? And it says, this section applies if a party to a contract A, let's say you, have obtained a valuable benefit before the time of discharge and the benefit was obtained because of anything done by me, the other party up to the contract, for the purposes of performing the contract. In that case, I, B, uh, may recover from you the sum, if any, that the court considers just. And then it says that for the purposes of subsection two, for um, determining what's a just sum, the court must have regard to all the circumstances and in particular, A, the amount of any expenses incurred before the time of discharge by A, in or for the purpose. So any amount that you've incurred, right, including any money you've paid to me, which you can now claim back under section 62, and 
the effect in relation to the benefit of the circumstances that gave rise to the frustration of the contract. So, for example, in a contract where um, you pay for my services, um, I am allowed, it, and I've conferred some services on you, I'm allowed to make a claim against you for um, a just, uh, just sum, all right? If I've conferred a benefit on you, any benefit other than money, it could be a thing, it could be services. The just sum cannot exceed the value of the benefit which has been conferred, and that should be fixed. Um, so what you see is that in BP and Hunt, Mr. Justice Goff came up with the two-stage approach. Stage one, you identify and you value the benefit which has been conferred, either in terms of the thing or the services, right? And then step two, you assess what is the just sum to be awarded to be, right? And so let's start with um, stage one. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, the starting point is to assess the market value, the objective market value of the benefits conferred. Where um, one party transfers goods to the other party, the benefit is pretty easy to identify. It's the value of the thing, objective value of the thing. Okay. Now, the problem is that Mr. Goff, Mr. Justice Goff said that the benefit will usually denote the end product of services rather than the services themselves. All right. So they said, look, the benefit is what's left in your hand, the enhancement of the end product. Okay. Um, so if I want to, you know, do some, uh, fix your broken car, right? It's my services, but it enhances the value. The end product is a car that works as opposed to a car that doesn't. Now, he says, well, you know, a small service may create a very large valuable end product and lengthy services may create a worthless product, right? And that's um, difficult, right? If you, because in, in the market, we pay for services, um, even if they don't have an end product. For example, um, I'm a terrible singer, but if you pay me to sing for you, I will sing for you, right? But it, it's very hard to say that that has an end product, all right? Teaching, <laughs> you know, giving a lecture may have no end product if you don't assimilate it, if, you are, if you're not able to, to, um, to understand what I'm saying, all right? Now, if, if you are talking about services, you know, a bill, like I said, some things have an end product, writing a book or building a building, but some don't. For example, transport, um, doing a survey, um, entertainment, giving a holiday. Um, and so Mr. Justice Goff said, well, in the case of pure services, which are never intended to produce an end product, the benefit must be value of the services themselves. Now, there are no problems if you receive the completed performance. The problem is when there's only partial performance. Why? Because, well, it's quite reasonable for you to say, well, I'm prepared to pay for completed performance, but I never wanted part performance, right? And, um, uh, well, it's going to depend, isn't it? Because if I am supposed to deliver 100 masks and I only deliver 80, um, I think you can still say that you've received a benefit and you can still value it, right? But, um, or if we're talking about services, um, okay, if I'm going to paint your house uh, and I've painted all but the front door, um, it's, I haven't finished, but it doesn't take you very long to finish the front door yourself. And so it's clear that I've conferred a benefit on you. But then there will be other cases where part performance um, it's, it's more difficult to say that part performance confers a benefit. Um, for example, a haircut. It could be that I could say, well, you're giving me half a haircut and I, you know, look worse than I looked before. I'm not prepared to pay half for half a haircut or half a portrait or something like that. Okay, so um, the second problem is the reduction of the benefit by virtue of the frustrating event. So, for example, um, 
The question is, does it belong to stage one or to stage two? Let's say that um, I build you a garage, but a meteorite strike comes and destroys the garage, right? Do we put it in stage one or stage two? Now, Mr. Justice Goff said we put it in stage one, um, but I think he's wrong. And that's been heavily criticized because if you put it in stage one, if the thing is destroyed, then by definition, the claimant gets nothing because of stage one, you've got zero. Stage two, assessing the just sum where the ceiling is stage one, then the ceiling is zero, you will get zero. Okay? Rather, it should go into stage two, right? Um, that's the preferable place to consider. Um, you know, the effect of the just sum, it should go, because if you look at the um, wording of the act, all right, if you look at, um, I hope you can see, I'm pointing here, that six, six, section 63 a says, a party to a contract A has obtained a valuable benefit before the time of discharge. So it's directing us to look at the, what the value is before the frustrating event occurs. So we, we want to say, well, before, it was this, ah, but when we come to assessing the just sum, we will take into account the following, okay? First, of course, in order to determine what the just sum is, you decide what the ceiling of the award is. The ceiling of the award is stage one, and that fixes the maximum sum, maximum for the just sum. Then you take into account the effect of the frustrating event on the benefit conferred. You will take into account that um, uh, that the recipient now maybe long, no longer has it or only has part of it. Then you look at the contractual allocation of risk. You look at the you look at the contract price. All right. I don't want. It may be that you got a really good deal and you wouldn't have paid the full price. You got mates rates, and so the courts will look at what that job was worth to you, not what it's what it was worth in the market. And then um, they will also look at the recipient's expenses. What have they done, including um, any amount that they've paid, which they might be able to claim back. So basically that, you know, if you've got somebody, um, if, it's, if it's a contract for, of money for goods or money for services, you've got both a section 62 claim and a section 63 claim. And the court says we have to look at it as a whole. Okay, so, well, that's it from me. And I hope um, you now have some idea of when you can escape a contract because of radical change of circumstances that was unanticipated by either party. And that you have some idea of what happens to the uh, contract, we know it's just gone. And also what happens to the benefits received and the detriments incurred from the performance of the contract. Bye then.